That's so interesting. Well, thank your father for serving the next time you talk to him. Um, all right. So one of the biggest challenges um, with going to Vietnam is that soldiers were fighting a very different kind of war. Um, so first off, as uh, Dr. Peterson mentioned, many of the soldiers that went were drafted. They did not volunteer, which was very different than in World War II. Um, additionally, I believe the average age of a soldier during World War II was about their mid-20s, about 25, 26. And here we're dealing with um, young men about 18, 19 years old, um, many of whom are going just after having graduated from high school. And they're fighting an enemy that was very different than, you know, what they had encountered pre in previous wars. Um, the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese Army were known for a guerrilla fighting style, and that's kind of fighting in a way that is not the traditional um, type of warfare. Uh, there's a lot of booby traps and, you know, sneaking around. They use something called the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which is a secret network of different tunnels and pathways to get supplies. Um, and move soldiers from one place to another underground um, where the um, United States military couldn't see them. The Viet Cong soldiers blended in with the surrounding villages, uh, and it was very hard for soldiers to discern who was an enemy and who was a civilian. Um, and this is going to play a huge role later in the war um, just on the psychological impact uh, for soldiers fighting. Uh, Dr. Norton, are you going to read some of these facts as the war shifts? Sure. So um, with new fighting styles, new uh, different techniques, um, we've got a search and destroy plan here. So by 1966, the new tactic known as search and destroy was simple. Search out the enemy, destroy them in numbers so high that they wouldn't be able to continue fighting. That's what we, uh, Dr. Peterson was talking about, how they would use that Agent Orange to clear out the jungle and then get rid of them, right? And, and search and destroy. This was the first war in history where victory was not measured in territory gained, but in body count, lives dead, which would become, or which would come to take a toll on the morale of soldiers and the support of the American people. And 1966 is the year of escalation. 180,000 troops be becomes now 389,000 troops. Uh, so more than double and only a third of the soldiers were volunteers, so two-thirds are drafted, as Ms. Tinoco said. By 1969, there are now over a half a million troops in Vietnam, so it escalates quickly. And, and this goes back to the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, mm -hmm. where Congress gave the president the power to do whatever is necessary yes. to protect American lives in Vietnam. Yes. Mm -hmm. we keep going? Uh, yeah, so it was just, I think we meant, I, we started talking about a little bit of this, but just to kind of clarify, so it becomes really apparent in 1967 just how many American lives this war is costing, that it's not going to be over in eight weeks as it was initially thought at the very beginning. Um, and it's a very different type of war. On average, I think during World War II, a soldier saw about 10 days of like heavy combat fighting and Vietnam soldiers are seeing about 240 days of, of intensive fighting. Um, and then again, the psychological impact of, you know, the enemy hiding in plain sight with the Viet Cong soldiers um, really starts to take a toll both on soldiers there and also on Americans um, because this is the first war where uh, the war is coming into American homes via the television. A society about the uh, becoming a society of two cultures along generational lines and other kinds of lines. Why don't you get a haircut? My idea was basically to talk about America, talk about the problems, and at that time, I felt that the country was going to explode. It, was, it wasn't going to, it was exploding, and it was really happening. As the 60s came to a close, the violent and deadly backlash in Easy Rider was an eerie foreshadowing of real events to come. Cooperation with the armed forces of South Vietnam, attacks are being launched this week to clean out major enemy sanctuaries on the Cambodian Vietnam border. 
This is not an invasion of Cambodia. In May of 1970, when President Nixon announced that American troops were being sent into Cambodia, 350 college campuses erupted in violent protest. And Nixon had been promising, we're getting out of this. And all of a sudden, here comes this invasion of Cambodia. Another country added to the list. It was just a shockwave around the nation. At Kent State University in Ohio, the ROTC building was firebombed. The governor called in the National Guard. Taunts and rocks were thrown. Before it was over, four college students were shot and killed. They represented a country gone mad. American troops shot down American students who were taking classes. That's the point we had gotten to. After the violence of Kent State, polls found 58% of the respondents sided with the guardsmen, only 11% with the students. By order of President White, the university campus has been closed. Please return to your dormitories and leave the campus by the shortest route. The backlash of opinion against campus demonstrators would only grow. Following Kent State, some 75 colleges were closed down for the rest of the year. The cause, they said, was student unrest. Yeah, the, the division between um, just different groups in this country, especially I think that generational gap, that difference between the baby boomer generation, that young generation that is fighting the war, protesting the war, and their parents who are that greatest generation who had served in World War II, um, there was a big divide in you know what is duty and supporting your country and what is being able to voice your opinion and also how extremely different these two wars are. Um, in, in the start of that video, it was, there was a clip from a movie called Easy Rider, and, um, and he talks about it, and this, this, this uh, conflict um, between generations and philosophies and, and so on is so great that people are willing to fight over the dumbest, stupidest things, like how long a man's hair can be mm -hmm. is worth fighting over worth having a, a brawl, a fight, a gunshot. Um, and so, you, you know, I mean, when we're fighting over those kinds of things, we're having extreme uh, divisiveness. And, and one of the biggest things, and I had mentioned this previously, that becomes, um, I think, the, the shift of opinion is the fact that now Americans have televisions. The uh, many, many Americans, again, not all, um, and every night on, you know, the news, you have 50 million people tuning in to see what's going on in Vietnam. And instead of going to the movie theater and maybe seeing these film reels of what's going on in Europe and all of that during World War II, the war is happening in your living room. Um, you, you can't underestimate the role of technology. Yeah. And I think that can relate to you, the students, and what's going on today mm -hmm. and relating it to that because what Ms. Tunico just said is that every night, you know, you would listen to the president speak or leader speak and then you would see something completely different on mm -hmm. uh, television. And so it got to the point where like uh, the president said, we're winning the war, we're winning the war. And then uh, you would turn the television on and you would see, you know, American boys being killed. And, and it's like, doesn't feel like we're winning this war. And again, they, that starts to create a lot of doubt too. And when your government's saying one thing, but you're seeing something different, um, and then just the difference in reading something in a newspaper and then looking at a human being, you know, in, you know, on the television and having that kind of hum humanizing a war is, a, is going to have a huge effect on, on, public opinion. Uh, Ms. Morales, did you want to read this? Yeah. As the war lengthened, many Americans began to question U.S. involvement. The earliest soldiers in Vietnam had been volunteers, but by the end of 1965, 
most soldiers in Vietnam had been drafted and were not certain that preserving the government in South Vietnam was crucial to American interests. The lack of progress toward victory also led to doubt in the United States. The war strained government finances. President Johnson's Great Society Plan called for enormous spending to eliminate poverty, improve education and medical care, and fight for civil rights. Many Americans began to feel that attention and funding needed for these American causes was going to fight a war in Vietnam. Um, all right, so counterculture. So counterculture is again, like kind of going against the mainstream. Um, and this is where we're gonna look a lot more at the counterculture in our Zoom class um, next week. And uh, looking at the music of Vietnam, the protests of, of this time, um, but a lot of the challenges and the reason that there was some protests and some push for stepping out of the mainstream society was that many people felt that the draft was unfair. Uh, there were times where you could uh, defer your draft, meaning you could put it off for so many college students were able to put it off, which then creates this um, socioeconomic gap where you have the poor and the working class um, fighting this war more so than other uh, areas of society. And um, disproportionately many African Americans were dying and being sent away to fight in Vietnam at disproportionately high numbers. So again, you start to see many of these different divides um, within society. Um, and college campuses kind of become a, a center for anti-war uh, sentiments. And then also you have this kind of hippie counterculture. We have like Woodstock and, you know, this music and the, you know, peace and love, you know, that comes from this era, people going the complete opposite uh, way of, of supporting the war and that being the kind of free love um, type of idea. A lot of people think that you were either for the war or you are a hippie. It, you are either this or this. But um, now in 2020, and this is kind of goes to our vision, 2020 vision, right? Mm -hmm. um, we can look back and, and we realize it's not this or this. There are many things in between. And in fact, there's even more stuff over here and more stuff over here. Mm -hmm. And, um, but this idea that if you weren't for the war, you were against all of it. Or if you were against it, you were, you know, against all of this. So, um, that's just as a constant friction and it seems like there's no room for compromise. 